Let me welcome you all to Harvard Law School, the Ames Courtroom. My name is Charles Ogletree. I'm the uh, founder and the executive director of the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice. Many of you know that uh, Houston uh, was born in 1895 uh, and attended uh, both uh, Amherst College and then Harvard Law School. Uh, he graduated from Harvard Law School in 1922 and went back and uh, trained uh, what was called the social engineers of the 20th century. People like Thurgood Marshall, Oliver Hill, uh, and helped them come up with a strategy to end segregation. What they did was, in fact, uh, parallel and a companion piece to the great work that Fred Shuttlesworth did with Dr. King that you'll hear more about today. And we are more than delighted uh, to have Sapphira Shuttlesworth here. The Reverend is sitting somewhere right there. Uh, please welcome her. You'll hear from her later today. And uh, a number of uh, legends in the civil rights uh, movement. Uh, I have to say that uh, Omar Abdul Malik and I have been talking about this for a couple of years. In fact, we had conversations with uh, Mr. Shettlesworth about what we're trying to do. Uh, and it was a remarkably uh, and tremendous loss for all of us when he uh, passed away uh, last year. Uh, but like Dr. King and Thurgood Marshall and Constance Baker Motley and Rosa Parks, he's gone but will never be forgotten. And you'll hear a, just a tad about his legendary work uh, tonight uh, and his defiance tonight uh, uh, and how many generations of young people have been influenced by the great work that he and uh, Martin Luther King and others did uh, in the 20th century. Uh, my uh, partner in this, as I mentioned, is uh, Omar uh, Abdul Malik, uh, who has been uh, talking with the Shuttlesworths for a long time and making all this happen, and he's going to uh, be the co-host of the program tonight. Uh, please welcome Omar Ab Abdul Malik. Thank you very much. Uh, before I uh, make my remarks, I'm going to make a few announcements. Uh, first of all, today is Bob Marley's birthday. And I want to recognize a few distinguished, that you're all distinguished, but uh, you know, there's some uh, people that I want to uh, recognize in the audience is the uh, Ambassador uh, Walter Carrington, sitting here. Uh, Reverend Virgil Woods. The esteemed uh, theologian and scholar, Harvey Cox. Uh, the great and uh, famous Callie Cosley. And, and the lovely as well. And uh, Professor uh, Kevin uh, Almer and uh, Dr. Hassan, who brought their classes with them, and they, both of them to stand. Okay, uh, to uh, set the tone for my uh, introduction to my film uh, <laughs> is uh, I'd like to uh, read a short chapter, a very short chapter from the Holy Quran, uh, first in Arabic and then in English. A'uzu bidahi mene shaitani rajim, bismillahi rahmani rahim, walasr in nawasan al and the English translation is, in the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, by the measurement of time, surely mankind is at loss, except those who engage in the constant pursuit of excellence and wisdom and the teaching of the saints. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and honored guest. It is my honor to introduce video footage that pays homage to three great men who epitomize the attributes spoken of in the aforementioned text. These men distinguished themselves in the struggle for civil and human rights in post-World War II America and beyond. William Lucy, inherited the mantle of the great A. Philip Randolph, and by combining labor, politics, and the human and civil rights struggle, won victories for workers and people of color in South Africa and the American South. 
Norman Hill walk, work, worked alongside A. Philip Randolph and Bayard Rushton in the organization of the March on Washington. And today he heads the organization that bears his name. The great Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth was known for his heightened sense of spirituality that enabled him to face death threats, beatings, and assassination attempts in his preeminent role in the movement as a mentor to Martin Luther King. The brief footage you are about to see is taken from the Cambridge Center's upcoming documentary, The Secular and Sacred View of the Civil Rights Movement, and a film on the life of Reverend Shuttlesworth by the young Birmingham cinema cinematographer, Arthur Crenshaw. Thank you for coming. Enjoy the film. Peace be unto you. Let me start by trying to put all this in, in, in context if I, I can. Um, October 5th may just be another day in, in history for most of us, but uh, for me it was a, a, a triple uh, whammy of a day. Uh, we learned that uh, morning that uh, uh, Steve Jobs had passed away. Uh, and I learned that my uh, mentor and teacher, my uh, daughter's teacher, Derek Bell, passed away. Uh, and the shocking news came uh, that day that uh, Reverend Shuttlesworth had passed away as well. Uh, and it just uh, a reminder of how much history was lost uh, in the course of a day, but a reminder of how precious life uh, has been. Uh, and uh, as much as we talk about the, the movement uh, over the course of the, the next hour, it's, it's so hard for people, and there are some in this room, uh, so far for people who weren't around uh, in the 1960s to appreciate uh, the amount of sacrifice that uh, these individuals made, uh, the beatings, the death threats, uh, uh, the jail time, uh, the resistance, the hatred uh, was just palpable uh, throughout uh, the South and it wasn't just a Southern problem but throughout the country. Uh, and uh, these individuals uh, stood strong and did a lot to, to make our community better. Uh, one of uh, the little girls at that time uh, was Diane McWhorter, uh, who grew up uh, in Alabama and has written a phenomenal book called Carry Me Home, uh, The Climactic Battle of the Civil Rights uh, Revolution in Birmingham, Alabama. It won almost every book award imaginable, including the Pulitzer Prize, uh, and it tells both the story of uh, Reverend Shuttlesworth and others uh, uh, in that glorious battle, uh, for justice and equality and civil rights. But it also talks about her own family's uh, history, uh, very poignant and powerful and wrenching detail of what it was like growing up in the South in that period, a uh, very difficult period for, for so many. Uh, her book's available now in paperback. It's actually uh, for sale here for $16 uh, by the uh, bookstore. Uh, they, I think they only accept credit cards, right? You kept cash? No, only credit cards. So. Uh, if you only have a credit card and, and don't have cash, or you only have cash, get a friend with a credit card, and they'll take care of you as well. Uh, and uh, it's just a reminder of how much uh, we've learned and how much we need to learn in terms of uh, the, the struggle for justice. So uh, please uh, welcome to the stand author, uh, esteemed, uh, great teacher, a great leader, uh, a person who spoke truth to power. Please welcome Diane McWhorter. Thanks, Professor Ogletree. I want to also thank the, um, I'm here um, this year under the auspices of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, so I want to thank them for bringing me here. Um, thank you so much for letting me be part of this and hog, horn in on Shuttlesworth's glory here. I, I'm going to start out by addressing the elephant in the room, which is that the script that seems to have emerged about Shuttlesworth is that, and I've been guilty of promoting it myself, is that he seems destined to be consigned to the shadow of Martin Luther King. Um, but let's be real, um, King has so come to own the story of the Civil Rights Movement that it's really only in comparison to his uh, mythic status that other people can be judged. Um, and, and really, who, who in the struggle, besides maybe John Lewis, Andy Young, uh, Jesse Jackson, does anybody coming up now recognize so in a way, saying that, that Shuttlesworth has been overshadowed by King is like saying Grant was overshadowed by Lincoln. Um, 
And parenthetically, I suspect that when some people uh, complain that Shuttlesworth is not better known, what they're, what they're really wondering is, why is Ralph Abernathy better known than Fred Shuttlesworth? Uh, and that's um, with, within the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, with, which Shuttlesworth founded along with King and two other ministers in 1957. Uh, Abernathy, King, and Shuttlesworth were known as the big three. And since Abernathy was basically a rubber stamp for King and more a helpmeet and a jailmate than an than a independent leader and strategist, um, what really happened in the movement is that the two um, axes were um, Shuttlesworth, the confronter, and King, the conciliator. Uh, unlike Abernathy, Shuttlesworth was not only an independent leader with a, with a mass following that he sustained over many years, but um, he was a very crucial historical catalyst uh, who pushed the movement onto new frontiers of militancy. Now, if you could have been, uh, oh, now, just to, for those of you who aren't, who aren't uh, familiar so much with the Birmingham story, the, the most succinct summary I can give you is, is to compare the Battle of Birmingham in, in 1963 to Gettysburg, even though I know Grant was not at Gettysburg, he was at Vicksburg during that time. Um, but uh, the great demonstrations mounted by King and Shuttlesworth there in 1963 uh, which were answered by the city of Birmingham's now iconic fire hoses and police dogs, uh, were what led President Kennedy to introduce federal legislation to abolish segregation. And that was passed after his death as the Magnificent Civil Rights Act of 1964. So that is, in, in sum, the significance of Birmingham and the significance of Shuttlesworth. He, more than probably any person, gets credit for bringing about the end of legal segregation in this country. Now, if you could have been at his funeral in Birmingham in October, uh, and it was a state funeral by almost every, every measure, and heard the accounts that unfolded over three days of commemoration, uh, you would really come away with the conviction that what this man did, both what he withstood and what he accomplished, transcends almost any abstract notion of fame or even recognition. Uh, though, P.S., he does have an airport named after him, the Birmingham Shuttlesworth Airport. And I have to say uh, that I, who probably know his career as well as anyone, and as a journalist am professionally indoctrinated to be cynical and underwhelmed by everything, uh, and just find myself continually overwhelmed by the footprint he left behind, um, which is to say that I didn't uh, bat a jaundiced eye during the funeral when he was compared by his colleagues to uh, Noah and the Apostle Paul. Um, for another part of Shuttlesworth's legend, um, part of the script is his inconceivable courage. You saw examples of that on the film. Um, and sometimes his seeming bionicness has drawn focus away from the abuses he underwent and, and prevents us from fully absorbing the brazen, violent injustice that he fought against and that was happening with impunity in this country. Uh, I'm now working on a book that partly concerns Nazi Germany, and it's made me look at what Shuttlesworth underwent in, in, with a fresh eye. And if things had turned out differently in this country, if our master race policies had led to genocide instead of a nonviolent social revolution, then we would be looking back on what Shuttlesworth endured in Birmingham with the same incomprehension, disbelief, and horror that are now the exceptional burdens of Germany. Um, so in a sense, Shuttlesworth's, except, Shuttlesworth's exceptional courage uh, has not served him that well, or has at least not served him that adequately, because he sometimes comes off as this indestruct, indestructible cartoon character who always gets up no matter how many times he's knocked down. Again, I plead guilty to promoting that um, image because in my op-ed piece about him after his death, I compared him to uh, the Roadrunner, um, even though I could, <laughs> and I tried to extend the metaphor to his arch nemesis, Bull Connor, the police commissioner, as Wiley Coyote, but there were just too many animals going on besides Bull and a Coyote, there were also the police dogs. Uh, so I abandoned that. Um, but um, with this image of Shuttlesworth, however flattering and impressive, not to mention a godsend to us writers, fails to get at is his historical importance. And that's what I want to leave uh, you with tonight. Um, 
and especially because this is a, a forum that concerns itself with labor, um, how it comes out of Birmingham special standing as the most labor conscious city in the South. Now just to summarize the mark that Shuttlesworth made on the movement, let me make two observations. He was the only leader in, S in SCLC who actually commanded a mass following over the years. Um, in June of 1956, in response to the state of Alabama's outlawing the NAACP, he in Birmingham founded an organization called the uh, Alabama Christian Mo Movement for Human Rights, which became the template for SELC, which was uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was founded a few months later. Um, and also, Shuttlesworth was the pioneer of direct action in the movement. Um, as he, he, he really led the movement into its, its season of civil disobedience. You'll remember that the, the Montgomery bus boycott, which we think of as the, the, the beginning of the modern civil rights movement, was really a protest of passive resistance. The, uh, the, the black citizens of Montgomery stayed off the buses rather than actively disobeying uh, any unjust laws. Now, when the Supreme Court decision desegregated the Montgomery buses in, in December of 1956, uh, that didn't apply to the Birmingham buses. And so uh, Shuttlesworth uh, decided that he was going to actively disobey the, the, the segregation laws, and he warned his followers that this was going to require sacrifice uh, to wit going to jail, which had not been a movement sacrament uh, at that point. Um, so on Christmas morning of 1956, soon after the successful conclusion of the Montgomery bus boycott, he preached from his pulpit, um, if it takes being killed to get integration, I'll do just that thing, for God is with me all the way. That night, the Klan bombed his parsonage. You saw footage of, of some of the, the, the ruins of his parsonage, causing the ceiling to cave in around him, and he walked out of it unscathed. Um, he said to me, this is where I was blown into history. Uh, the following morning, he went ahead and with his planned protest and dispatched followers to illegal seats on the front of Birmingham's buses, and his ensuing arrest was the first in a series that would make him SCLC's most jailed leader. Um, he was also the movement's most prolific uh, plaintiff for Supreme Court test cases. Um, notably, he was one of the four movement ministers named as defendants along with the New York Times in the case that became uh, Sullivan versus New York Times, which established the uh, absence of malice standard for, for libel of public figures. Um, and not too many know, people know that Shuttlesworth was, was one of the main plaintiffs of the, in that case. Um, within SCLC, Shuttlesworth was known mostly with affection as the wild man from Birmingham. Um, as one activist explained his rather scant uh, uh, <laughs> uh, following among the black clergy in Birmingham, he, goes, he said, well, there were, there were a few ministers who didn't want their churches to get bombed, uh, or who weren't afraid of get, their churches getting bombed. Um, he was rather autocratic uh, within his own organization, and when uh, Ralph Abernathy once said to him pointedly, Fred, I'm not a dictator, uh, Fred replied, um, well, God is a dictator, a benevolent dictator. Um, he had felt anointed to lead the movement, uh, anointed by God when he survived that bombing, um, the Christmas bombing of his church in 1956, and he said, I literally tried to get myself killed. Um, he very nearly got his wish. I, I counted at least three assassination attempts against him, including the Klan, another Klan church bombing in 1958 and a plot to kill him at the Birmingham airport. And, um, you, uh, he was also beaten by a mob in front of Phillips High School. You saw him revisit that scene in the film. And when he, when he personally tried to take his two daughters to desegregate it in 1957, and shortly before that, the Klan had abducted a uh, black man from the side of the road who had no involvement in the movement and um, castrated him to send a message to Shuttlesworth. Um, I think my favorite story of Shuttlesworth, which uh, <laughs> um, concerns the Freedom Rides of 1961, um, after those integrated bus drivers had been uh, beaten bloody by the Klan in both Birmingham and Montgomery, and uh, the high command of the Civil Rights Movement is conv convened in, in um, Ralph Abernathy's church in, in Montgomery on uh, May 21st of 
1961, and James Farmer, who was the head of the Congress of Racial Equality, who had organized the Freedom Riders, the Freedom Riders had, was flying into the, to Montgomery from uh, Washington, and uh, Shuttlesworth volunteers to go pick up Farmer at the airport. And, and here's uh, my account of this in a scene from Carry Me Home, um, and it, it largely comes from uh, Farmer's frequent retelling of it. Can you get me to that church, Brad, Farmer asked. Wrong question, Jim. The only question to ask is how will I get you there? A few blocks from First Baptist, Confederate flag wavers surrounded Shuttlesworth's car and began to rock it. Shuttlesworth smiled at the assailants as his driver shifted into reverse and made a screeching U-turn. At, a, a at a black taxi stand, Shuttlesworth consulted a cabbie. I have Jim Farmer, Farmer he said, who prescribed a circuitous path by <clears throat> way of Oakwood Cemetery. Stymied again by the mob, Shuttlesworth got out of the cab. Coke bottles shattered car windows around him as he paused to register a strange smell his first whiff of tear gas. Then he beckoned Farmer out of the car and strode into the mob. Farmer followed, scared as hell, Farmer said, trying to shrink his bon vivant's ample body into Shuttlesworth's thin shadow. The goons parted, their clubs went slack, and Shuttlesworth walked up to the doors of First Baptist without a threat on his jacket disturbed. Out of the way, was all he said. Go on, out of the way. And he said to me, <laughs> when, I, when, he, when I asked him about this story, I'm only a little fellow, but so was Jesus Christ. Uh, <laughs> that, sums it, that sums Rev up. Uh, um, when Carry Me Home came out, um, I did quite a, bit of, quite a few interviews, and there were two things that people always wanted to talk about, whether it was NPR or urban radio or right -wing, the number of right-wing radio shows I did in Birmingham, and that was Shuttlesworth. And, of course, and uh, the second thing was the New Deal section of my book. And apparently it was news to everybody that the struggle between the Civil Rights Movement led by Shuttlesworth and <clears throat> the uh, segregationist resistance that was epitomized by Birmingham uh, and fronted by Bull Connor had actually begun in the 1930s as a struggle between organized labor and the industrialists of Birmingham. And Birmingham was the heavy manufacturing center of the Deep South and its reputation as the Johannesburg of America, the most segregated in the country, was bound up in its proud claim to being the Pittsburgh of the South, the dynamite that gave Birmingham its other nickname of Bombingham, uh, had been the tool of the local steel industry, the, literally the substance that uh, blasted, from, blasted coal, the coal from the mines that uh, fueled the local blast furnaces. And the industrialists, who were elegant men uh, with whom I had lunch at the country club after church on Sundays, uh, they were, were known as big mules, um, had done cruel and devious things to, um, to uh, foment racial strife between their black and white workers in order to keep wages depressed and the unions weak. And this was, uh, as I learned in doing the book, was just one of the classic ways in which uh, racial com conflict is often a camouflage for class conflict. Um, the big mules had hired vigilantes to beat up labor organizers uh, on the grounds that they were promoting social equality between the races. U.S. Steel, which was the, the world's largest corporation and also uh, the biggest employer in Birmingham, had sponsored a fake grassroots organization called the League to Maintain White Supremacy. Uh, they provided high-priced lawyers for the Ku Klux Klan in the 1930s and 40s, and uh, they bankrolled racist, anti-Semitic propagandists who painted the labor movement as a communist th uh, conspiracy of, uh, between Jews and their Negro dupes. And these propagandists even had ties to Nazi Germany in this country. And Franklin Roosevelt, of course, had, had put the might of the federal government behind the right of workers to organize and bargain collectively through Section 7A of the National Industrial Recovery Act. And as organizers from the United Mine Workers came south and told miners the president wants you to organize, so did the, uh, the local industrialists counter with their own charismatic um, mascot, none other than Eugene Bull Connor. Bull Connor had been installed in City Hall by the industrialists as a sort of sop uh, to the masses to try to, to turn them against the New Deal and their proxies in organized labor. 
Um, which brings me to the other important historical function of Shuttlesworth that often gets overlooked. He was the thread of continuity between the modern civil rights movement and the left liberal anti-segregation initiatives of the New Deal era, which were ep epitomized by an organization called the Southern Conference for Human Welfare, which had its founding meeting in Birmingham in November of 1938. It was largely funded by the Congress of, Racial, of Industrial Organizations, the CIO, um, and um, the meeting was what I described in Carry Me Home as the most remarkable group of world savers ever under one roof. Academics and iron workers, social scientists and poets, communists and Klansmen, and a pageant of New Deal grandees led by Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black from Birmingham and First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. And um, this was the inauguration of the concerted, concerted struggle for freedom that would culminate in Birmingham, thanks to Fred Shuttlesworth a quarter of a century later. And Eleanor Roosevelt had made waves during that meeting by refusing to ob observe the segregation ordinances uh, separating blacks and whites in, the, in, the in an auditorium. And uh, the, the person, the law enforcement official who enforced the statute was none other than Bull Connor. And that was his sort of debut on the national stage. Um, he uh, patented the tactics, the tactics of red and black baiting that would be, he'd be using against the civil rights movement for the coming decades, and which had certainly marginalized the Great New Deal Coalition of the Southern Conference for Human Welfare by the time uh, the so-called modern movement happened with the bus boycott. Um, most of Shuttlesworth's colleagues in the movement kept their distance from organizations that were tainted as red, uh, that had, you know, the segregationists uh, were always saying that the civil rights movement was uh, directed by communists. But Shuttlesworth's standard retort to the red baiters as well as to his uh, more timid colleagues in the movement was, I don't need a communist to tell me what democracy is. Um, in 1963, he had accepted the presidency of the last surviving remnant of the Southern, of the Southern Conference for Human Welfare, which had been renamed the Southern Conference Educational Fund, or SCEF, which you may have heard of. Um, and when King and Abernathy asked Shuttlesworth to resign this post, he replied, uh, I, I'll resign from SCLC. Uh, and when SCEF had been left off the list of sponsoring organizations for the March on Washington in 1963, Shuttlesworth had pressured uh, them to, the organizers to, to put them back on. Um, so I would propose in closing that instead of thinking of Shuttlesworth as an unsung hero, and I said this in my uh, remarks at his funeral, I prefer to think of him as uh, a hero's hero, um, and who needs credit when, you're, when your achievement breathes life into a city, into a nation, and a people every day, uh, even as we tackle the ever unfinished work that my and Shuttlesworth's native state, state seems to provide for this country decade after decade. Um, Alabama is now the uh, test case for this anti-immigration uh, uh, movement in the country, and I promise you it's going to rise and fall in Alabama. It's, it's, it's like Groundhog Day for 1963 there now. Um, and in light of this, the example of Shuttlesworth never seems more urgent than now. So thank you for honoring him. Thank you so much for that uh, context of history. That's very, very important what we're attempting to do. There's no surprise, as you'll learn from uh, our speakers tonight, that uh, this is the traditional uh, idea of what the civil rights movement was about. It was a coalition. It was a faith community. It was the labor community. Uh, it was the uh, leaders of the civil rights movement. They all worked together to make uh, possible for us to be where we are today. Uh, and there's no surprise at all today either that uh, this event tonight is sponsored by uh, three organizations in particular, the Labor and Work Life uh, Program here at Harvard, run by um, uh, Elaine uh, Bernard, who's right here. The, the W.B. Du Bois Institute, which is run by my colleague and friend, Professor Henry Louis Gates, Jr., uh, and uh, by the uh, Cambridge Center for the Study of Religion and Public Policy, run by uh, my good friend, uh, right here, Omar Malik, uh, Omar Abdul Malik, uh, for the great work that he's been doing in making this happen. 
Uh, and we want to uh, present a few awards before we have a discussion because, you know, it's, it's one thing to just have the great leaders here, but it's also to recognize in, in very uh, significant ways our gratitude for the sacrifices that have been made. Uh, and uh, uh, Reverend Shillersworth, we want to honor your uh, husband uh, through you for the great work that he did in this country, and we'd like to present you with an award now uh, on his behalf and for the work that continues to be done uh, in light of the footsteps that he left. Uh, so please uh, uh, welcome uh, Reverend Zafira Shillersworth to the uh, stage. For to Dr. Ogletree, our friend Omar Abdul Malik, to our esteemed panelists, including our good friend Diane McWhorter. It is a pleasure to be here in Cambridge at Harvard with you this evening. Watching the film was difficult for me. As you might imagine, yesterday marked the fourth month that Fred transitioned and the void that he left behind, not only within me, but within our society, has been extraordinary. But the good that he left behind supersedes that. As I strolled through the streets of Cambridge earlier today, I was overcome with the reality that the influence of our nation's founders looms eternal everywhere. And suddenly the impact of history read from a book somehow seemed less important. I found myself yearning to know more of our collective story. I was reminded that the same feeling is alive and well in the historical streets of Birmingham, Alabama, where the impact of the life and work of another great American, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, is so prevalent. My late husband challenged us all in what would be his final interview. He said we must tell the story, the whole story, and then light a fire under future generations, letting them know as long as there exists the struggle between good and evil, our work is never done. Fred Shuttlesworth, driven by his thirst for justice and righteousness and his love for all mankind, lived a dramatic life in pursuit of those same inalienable rights penned by our nation's forefathers some 235 years ago. For his efforts on the road from oppression to freedom he would endure beatings, bombings, arrests, persecution, and countless threats against his life and the lives of his family. If he were here, he would tell you that knowing the outcomes, he'd do it all over again. His courage and fiery personality undergird his legacy. Known as the Civil Rights Lion, he roared with unprecedented, unseen, raw courage in the face of oppression, demanding a better way of life for the poor and disenfranchised, whom he called the least, the lost, and the left behind. It is appropriate that the law school here at Harvard has chosen to honor this hero's hero of the civil rights movement, since much of his life's work targeted the plethora of unjust laws primarily strewn throughout the South, which denied Negro citizens basic human and civil rights. Prior to his death, it had been documented that Fred Shuttlesworth had had more cases heard at the Supreme Court level than any other living American spending countless hours conducting research in the law libraries in Birmingham in order to challenge the evil system of segregation, he would later dub himself a lawyer without portfolio. I'll share with you my favorite story before I close. 
of Fred Shuttlesworth. It would be the Christmas evening bombing of his home, 1956. He would tell you that it was about 9.45 p.m. One of his deacons and deacon's uh, wife was visiting. He was lying in his bed, the deacon sitting in a chair near the foot of the bed. They were in conversation. Their wives were in a room away. The bomb went off. He said he knew it was a bomb. He knew it was for him. He said that the Klan intended to blow him into heaven. He said that the springs on the bed on which he was lying, there was no piece as large as his fist left. He landed on the mattress in a hole, a gaping hole, in what used to be the floor. He said the wall in front of him was at a 45 degree angle by this time and he could see the sky. And he said that Moses was right, underneath thee are the everlasting arms. He said that what was on his mind at that time was the 27th number of the Psalms. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When my enemies crept upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell, and he said because they ran into Mr. God. That was what was on his mind. As he got up and blew the dynamite dust out of his nose, put on his overcoat, and stepped out into the dark. As he emerged from the back of the house, he would tell you that there was a rather large police officer, a white gentleman, who was standing near the front. And he said as he moved forward, the police officer would move backward. And eventually, they had conversation. The police officer said, Mr. Shuttlesworth, I tell you what, if it were me, I want to give you some advice. If I were you, I'd get out of town as quickly as possible. And he said, well, officer, you're not me. And you go back and tell your clan brethren that if God could save me from this, I am here for the duration and the war has just begun. My only regret is that Fred is not with us this evening to receive this high honor, recognizing his life's work. He told me many times that while the accolades of his fellow man were appreciated, the one that he was most concerned about was that great reward he longed to receive on that glad morning when he would finally behold the face of his maker. He wanted nothing more than to hear those eternal words, well done, my good and faithful servant, well done. On behalf of Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, the most extraordinary man I have yet had the pleasure to call my friend, I am pleased to accept this honor. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. That was outstanding. It was worth the uh, three years. <laughs> Three years wait. Okay, uh, at this time, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Jack Trumpor to uh, come forward and he's going to introduce the remainder of our distinguished uh, guests and panelists. Jack. Thank you, Omar. You've heard a great deal about Reverend Shuttlesworth's tremendous contributions, and one of the things we've tried to do today is just as many people didn't, uh, didn't hear of the, the incredible things that Reverend Shuttlesworth had done, um, people in Birmingham obviously know all about him, but uh, many other parts of the country you didn't get his appreciation. One of the things that we've tried to do is also draw attention to the role of the labor movement in the civil rights movement. Oftentimes, those connections are not made. And uh, I really appreciate it in your, your talk, Diane McWhorter, at the end, you uh, made some of those connections for us. And I um, 
I think we're very honored today because we have two of the people who really were instrumental in connecting the labor movement with civil rights struggles and struggles around the world. Um, first off, we have Mr. Bill Lucy here. William Lucy, one of the co-founders of the Free South Africa movement. He was somebody who played a tremendous role in Memphis. You know, people still to this day forget that Dr. Martin Luther King, he was there to support workers in a, in a labor struggle. And I'm happy to say also we have the, one of the leaders of, of the AFSCME local in Memphis who represents the sanitation workers, Chad Johnson, and we're gonna have him come up a little later after you hear from, from Mr. Lucy. But William Lucy was the founder and president of the, of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists um, working at the Labor and Work Life Program and the Harvard Trade Union Program, we've been very honored because both he and Norman Hill have played an important role working with us over the years. We had several African American Labor Leaders Economic Summits throughout the 1990s into the early 2000s, and they, they are people who have tried to, tried to raise issues that sometimes people in the labor movement, dominant people in the labor movement, sometimes needed, needed to be brought, brought to their attention. And they also did a lot to try to connect intellectuals to the labor movement. The United States, we're often told that um, we're a society that has a bit of anti-intellectualism, but both of them were very serious in trying to get the best ideas for the labor movement. And, and, and try to work with some of our best intellectuals to do those things. So, um, so uh, first off, I'd like to um, have um, Mr. Bill Lucy come up um, and, and uh, say some words about, about the labor movement. And we also wanted him to talk a little bit about his days in Memphis and making some of those connections and take it up to now. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Jack, for a very kind introduction. Let me um, say to the organizers of this and my old buddy from Washington, D.C., Omar, for um, inviting me to come by and be a part of uh, this tribute, both to the uh, role that uh, Jack just mentioned with regards to labor and civil rights, but, but more importantly for me, uh, to identify with the work of uh, Reverend Shuttlesworth and Dr. King and all of the struggles that they collectively uh, fought through. And to share a panel with uh, Norm Hill uh, is really an honor. And, and let me, for, for, for openness, uh, I've been in this crazy labor movement for about 59 years, give or take a couple. Uh, I moved to Washington, D.C. in 1966 from Contra Costa, California. Uh, and I came to take on the responsibility of our union of developing a legislative and community affairs program that tried to marry labor and religion uh, to the um, activist movement. And the very first person I met and talked with when I came to Washington, D.C. was Norm Hill. Uh, I was as green as a pool table and twice as square. Uh, <laughs> And Norm helped me to understand the nature uh, of these relationships because he uh, viewed them from the teachings of A. Philip Randolph. And it was just so, I was so appreciative of it then and still am now. Elaine, who has uh, struggled with me for many years as a part of the program, uh, I served for about 40 years as Secretary Treasurer of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. Uh, which uh, under the leadership of Jerry Wirth, uh, we sponsored the program hoping, as someone said, to tie labor to the intellectual community. I'm not quite sure where we stand on that yet, uh, but we're gonna continue to try. Uh, I retired about a year and a half ago uh, from the union, as I said, after 57 or more years of service. And during the course of that service, two individuals uh, had such an incredible impact uh, on my life. 
and how I perceive the role of institutions in our society. Um, one was a um, writer and a social activist, a fellow by the name of Michael Harrington, uh, who wrote a tremendous book on his analysis of the conditions of many people throughout this land, the poverty, the lack of education, the undereducation, uh, and the powerness, powerlessness. Uh, Mike's work uh, became sort of the underpinning for uh, Lyndon Johnson as he approached uh, the so-called Great Society period. Uh, I was a, a, a young engineer back then, and uh, reading Mike's work uh, raised the question of, with me anyhow, of can't you do something more useful uh, with your life rather than build highways and bridges and stuff. Uh, maybe you could contribute to building a life someplace. So I got interested in it. Uh, the other two people, I should say, was uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and his campaign for fairness and social justice and Reverend Shelburne. Uh, and to be mentioned or allowed to participate in a program that honors the work of Dr. Uh, Shuttlesworth is just really a, a, an honor for me. Uh, we shared a platform some years ago in Columbus, Ohio, either Columbus or, uh, or Cleveland, one of those two, and he was as sharp then as he was before. Some of us really thought that uh, uh, Reverend Shuttlesworth was gonna have to have an advanced program in nonviolence. Uh, because his natural inclination was, was not there. I mean, it, it was somewhere else. That's correct. Uh, but he made such a contribution uh, to the movement. And what we saw here tonight uh, is just an inkling of that. Um, we tend to read somebody else's history and judge the value of contributions. Um, the Labor Religious Civil Rights Coalition has been almost unnatural for a long time. The Montgomery bus boycott, uh, it may have won, but it would not have won without E.D. Nixon and the contribution that he made to the coalition that was waging that fight. Uh, and, and we should always be mindful uh, that uh, as someone said, that, that we are essentially a working people. And Dr. King's uh, perception was that there's something fundamentally wrong uh, when you work every day and still cannot raise yourself out of poverty uh, beyond your condition. This was, uh, I guess, a thread that run through, or ran through his view of the two great movements uh, that ought to be arm and arm. We fought to make that a reality uh, by trying to teach our way through the programs and through the processes. And yet, it was always direct action that made things happen. Now, I'm convinced that, that, that some of the intellectuals and what have you could talk all day long, but it really required a Reverend Shelsworth to, to even propose the unthinkable before something would happen. And it was these kinds of, of activities that created what we now call the modern civil rights uh, institutions. Uh, as a young trade unionist, I got to know them both. Uh, from Michael's work came many of the policies, as I said earlier, that shaped the core of the Johnson Great Society program, Head Start, Community Action, Job Corps, and a host of others that were so successful uh, during that period of the late 60s and 70s. Dr. King and Reverend Shuttlesworth also saw the plight of poor people in a domestic as well as a global context. And they grew a movement uh, to force government to play its proper role in alleviating the problems that government itself caused. Uh, I can't help but remember, as we said in the poor people's, in Resurrection City, uh, as the poor people's campaign eventually got to Washington, D.C., uh, one of the great ideas of our time 
civil rights workers, poor people from every corner of this nation, from all ethnic groups coming to Washington, D.C. to put a, pay, a face on poverty. Uh, I think the Poor People's Campaign was an idea that ultimately succeeded uh, because of the determination of people to get themselves out of their sense of powerlessness and make themselves uh, seen by the powers to be. Workers' rights. Uh, the civil rights movement is defined as the civil rights movement, yet it was a workers' rights movement. Dr. King was a workers' rights, a human rights, and social justice advocate, along with many of those who followed him in the work. And as was said, Dr. King's last work was in Memphis, Tennessee, on behalf of the sanitation workers of the city of Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, those 1,300 men who decided for themselves that they would no longer be treated as children, but as men. And this, this sign became probably one of the strongest messages that could conceivably be sent to a power structure. It simply said in four words, I am a man. The sign was put together after much thought. We, you know, when, you, when you're in the midst of a war, you're trying to figure out what does it take to keep this war together, keep the morale and the commitment and the dedication to the struggle together. And you keep thinking of all these high-flying, slow, you probably hire a New York ad firm to come up with something. Well, you know, a, a couple of folks got together uh, and was thinking of all kinds of things, and out of that discussion came this sign. And it was the glue uh, that convinced those men that they had to continue to fight because they had something to fight for. Uh, in Memphis, as well as many other places throughout the South, you can go from boy to uncle to grandpa without ever passing the position of man. And this held those strikers together for 67 days, the longest strike in the history of public service. Uh, they won. Uh, they won because they were determined to win. Dr. King paid the ultimate sacrifice in that strike, but it was a sacrifice that had to be paid. And those of us who were first fortunate enough to be allowed to participate will forever remember the courage, the commitment, uh, and the dedication of those men. This year, uh, the U.S. Labor Department uh, inducted all 1,300 of these men into Labor's Hall of Fame. Uh, and President Barack Obama welcomed them to the White House to have an opportunity to congratulate him himself on their achievement. And hopefully during the Q&A portion of this, we'll get an opportunity to discuss some of the intricate parts, of not just the Memphis sanitation strike, but other strikes and activities that labor, civil rights, and the religious community has been engaged in collectively.